Hello and welcome to the Atlas Kafka seminar series. Today we're going to talk about uh, torque theory. First, a quick overview of the agenda. We're going to talk about torque and clamping force. We're going to talk about the bolted joint. We're going to talk about accuracy and different tool types. First, torque and clamping force. Uh, we want to explain what torque is. So it's uh, when we measure the rotational moment of force into a fastener. Common units of measurement that you probably come across is uh, newton meters, foot pounds, inch pounds, kilogram force centimeters, and there are many more. To define torque, we look at this illustration of a bolt and we apply a wrench to this bolt, we turn it, we apply a force to it and uh, to calculate the force we look at the length of the wrench and we look at the applied force so in this case we have a 0.5 meter long wrench we apply 100 newtons of force and if we multiply these two numbers that gives us the torque so in this case 0.5 times 100 equals 50 newton meters Why do we use bolted joints? It's to clamp components together. And um, there are many advantages using bolts. And uh, it's um, an assembly that we can easily assemble and then take apart again. This is opposed to uh, say using welding or gluing, riveting, a serviceable item. So you can easily assemble and disassemble and reuse it again. It's also something that we can make traceable. If we record the tightening data, we, we measure the torque we apply, then we can log that and we have traceability to our assembly. Clamping force is really what we're after. And uh, the threads in the fastener that creates the clamping force. And there is a close relationship between torque and clamping force. The function of a bolted joint is to uh, clamp two or more components together in an assembly, your product. And um, there are a couple of definitions we would like to, to look at here. So we have the bearing surfaces, which is the areas under the, the head of the fasteners, uh, preload, which is the stretch of the fastener, and uh, clamping force, which is the force generated by this. Clamping force is really important. Without it, we risk that uh, components come apart in the field and uh, that can be resulting in really bad things. Say, your seat belts come loose, etc. Clamping force is our goal. So why do we measure torque? Well, there are good reasons for this. Measuring clamping force is quite difficult, especially in the production environment. Measuring torque, on the other hand, is quite easy. And as we said earlier, there is a close relationship between torque and clamping force. To achieve clamping force, we actually stretch the fastener itself. You can think of the fastener as a spring. The more load we apply to the fastener, the more stretch. Looking at a typical fastening, we have four phases. We have the rundown phase. This is before the components come together. Then we have the drawdown. Now we have connection or contact between the parts. The third phase is the elastic phase. This is uh, where we start stretching the bolt. And finally, the plastic phase. Now we can say that we're overstretching the bolts. Now we're in yield and the fastener will not retain its original shape again after we loosen it. So looking at this graphically, on the y-axis we have torque and on the x-axis we have angle. 
and uh, we see the rundown phase first with very little torque. We have the drawdown, then the elastic phase, and the plastic phase. If we go beyond the plastic phase, we will actually break the fastener eventually. Most fastening target is to be within the elastic region. Looking at what goes on in the bolt, again we look at torque and we look at angle and as we see the force building up here, at the top we have the tensile strength, that is the maximum force a fastener can take before braking. Proof load is the rated maximum load without permanent deformation. The yield point is after which we will uh, create permanent deformation of the fastener. Bolts often have markings that determines the, uh, the quality or the strength of the bolt. And in this case we look at 10.9 and uh, the 10 represents the maximum force the bolt can take before braking. And the 9 is the percentage to which we can use it before we actually reach the yield point of this fastener. When designing a joint or applying fastening, we need to know where the torque goes. Most of the torque actually goes into friction in the joint itself. And in this scenario, for a typical joint, we have about 10% going into actual clamping force. The rest is lost in friction under the bolt head and in the threads. There are different factors that affects friction. Uh, you see a list here of uh, a number of occurrences that can happen in your joint. If we look at the scenario here where we get oil contamination on the threads, this will reduce the friction in the threads. And the result here then is that the clamping force goes up proportionally. And uh, the effects of this could be that you overstretch the fasteners and uh, it could result in um, complete failure of the bolt. Here we see the opposite scenario. Here we have bolts that have been allowed to corrode and uh, now we're increasing the friction in the threads. And the result now is that uh, the, uh, the clamping force is almost lost or it can be completely lost and now we have no clamping force in our joint and the effects of that is that parts can come up disassembled because there's no clamp load holding them together. Different types of fasteners also affect the clamping force. So different bolt heads, we see an example here, say the flange head here has a different property of friction compared to the hexagon head next to it. Different types of nuts, say we have self-locking fasteners and for whatever reason some uh, plain nuts get mixed in in the assembly, now we're going to have less friction than we calculated with. Prevailing torque is also very common in fastening and we talk about two different types. We have um, intentional prevailing torque. This could be uh, thread forming fasteners, nylock nuts, etc. It's something that the fastening engineer calculates with to be there. The other type is unintentional prevailing torque. This could be caused by shadowing of parts. It could be, um, as we saw in the previous example, contamination of the threads. And uh, this can have some, some bad effects of your assembly. Possible effects on the power tool could be increased wear, possibly reduced uh, RPMs during the fastening process. Another occurrence in fastening is uh, joint relaxation. It's uh, what happens after the tightening has been made. Over a short period of time, you actually typically see a loss of torque or clamping force in the joint. 
Using power tools though, we have means to correct this, or at least help deal with it. And uh, what's common in uh, DC electric tools, for example, is a two-stage tightening, where we run to a snug torque, then we have a very short pause, and then we proceed to final torque. And this actually helps reduce a lot of the relaxation in the joint. There are also other ways, such as uh, advanced tightening strategies, uh, performing joint conditioning. A multi-spindle can jog the faster you go to a target, you back off, you sort of condition the joint, as, as mentioned, and uh, that will also help fighting relaxation in the joint. If we look at impulse tightening tools, the fast repeated impulse action here with micro pulses in between every pulse also tend to reduce relaxation in joints. Looking at different joint rates, there is an ISO definition for this to, that allows us to compare different tools. And uh, here we have uh, the definition illustrated. A hard joint is defined as 30 degrees of rotation from snug to final torque. As an example, in the bolted joint, you can see hard metal against metal. You have a bolt hitting a steel surface. There's no give, so that's a hard joint. We have a soft joint, and that's defined as 720 degrees. And uh, an example for this could be where you assemble something with a thick gasket that you have to compress. And now you need to turn the bolt at least twice to reach your target torque. The joint rate also have effects on how power tools operate. So what we can say in general, if we use a DC electric tool, we have greater means to, uh, to deal with joint rate effects in your fastening. Another thing you can say in general is that you will induce more wear on your power tool fastening uh, soft joints all day long because all the components are under duration or stress for longer periods of time. So let's talk a little bit about power tools and assembly in general. There are different tool types that we use and um, in this example we, we first look at uh, direct drive nut runners. These are nut runners that apply a force constantly to the fastener until we reach our target. So you can say we're winding up the joint. The second type we talk about is uh, low reaction tools. These tools um, apply torque by effectively hitting the fastener. So you can liken it with a hammer hitting the, the bolt or the wrench. And uh, this fast action to apply torque is what also gives us uh, the low reaction qualities of the tools. Talking about power tools, we also often talk about accuracy. And uh, there are two different things that we want to separate and that is the actual tool accuracy and the process accuracy. As an example here in the first dartboard you see the darts are not hitting the center but they're very close to each other so we have good tool accuracy in this example. In the second example the darts are concentrated and they're in the center of the dartboard and uh, this means that we have both good tool accuracy as well as process accuracy. When we look at different tool types, there's typical different accuracy that these tools can produce. At the very bottom of the pyramid, we have uh, impact wrenches, and these tools really have no means of torque control, so they're operator dependent. So in general, they, these tools don't provide good accuracy. If we go all the way up to the top, we have uh, a fixture DC nut runner, which is super accurate. And this is probably the, the best or the most accurate tool you can find. Talking about uh, fixture nut runners, they're not only super accurate, if you put them together, you can also accomplish uh, much faster cycle times because you're tightening down more than one fastener at a time. You have benefits with more even torque distribution and clamping force. 
they're a means that we can deal with incorrect fasteners through reject management and uh, we can assure that all fasteners are tightened correctly. If we look at an assembly where we have two fasteners that need to be tightened down, we uh, use a single spindle and run them down one at a time. And uh, after we're done, we can't really be sure about the clamping distribution in the joint anymore. There could be um, changes due to the flexion of parts, etc., that alters the actual clamp load, especially in the first fastener. If we perform the same assembly using a two spindle nut runner with synchronization, now we're running down together. The first fastener waits for the second fastener to reach the same torque. And after that, they will both continue at the same time to go to the final target torque. And by doing this, we ensure an even clamping force in the joint. There are different ways to measure or verify torque in an application. So we talk about dynamic torque measurement and we're talking about residual torque measurement. If we look at the dynamic torque measurement process, typically using an inline transducer or built-in transducer to the tool. And uh, in this process, we're sampling the torque buildup in the joint and as the tool shuts off, we have reached our target. We present that torque number as our peak torque. The other method is to measure after the fastening. So we have an already tightened fastener and uh, now we use a manual wrench. And if we look at the breakaway torque or sometimes also called static torque, it's the actual torque that you have to apply to, um, to get this fastener moving again. It means that you have to overcome both the, um, the clamping force and the uh, friction under the head of the fastener. The second point here is the residual torque. That's the actual torque that is remaining in this uh, fastener. And that's the, the true number of the torque that we most often look for. The peak torque is as we stop pulling on the wrench and most usually we have added a little bit of torque to the joint. So some conclusions to have a good fastening process of your products is to ensure consistency, both in the environment, your components, make sure that you avoid any damage to parts, etc. You can also use um, quality assembly processes and uh, most often this involves using DC electric tools where you can control what happens with the joint. I hope this uh, seminar has been of some uh, value to you and uh, I would strongly recommend the other seminars in this series. So we have the press theory seminar, we have the quality assurance global best practices seminar and we also have the error proofing with software seminar. Thank you for watching.